Chapter 21, Dr. Seward's Diary. 3rd October. Let me put down with exactness all that has happened, as well as I can remember it, since the last I made an entry. Not a detail that I can recall must be forgotten. In all calmness, I must proceed. When I came to Renfield's room, I found him lying in a pool floor on his left side in a glittering pool of blood. When I went to move him, it became at once apparent that he had received some terrible injuries. There seemed none of that unity of purpose between the parts of the body, which marks even a lethargic insanity. As the face was exposed, I could see that it was horribly bruised, as though it had been beaten against the floor. Indeed, it was, as simple as it was from the face wounds that the pool of blood originated. The attendant, who was kneeling beside the body, said to me as, I, as we turned him over, I think, sir, that he, his back is broken. See, both his right arm and leg and the whole side of his face are paralyzed. How could such a thing happen to puzzle the attendant beyond measure? He seemed quite bewildered, and his brows were gathered as he said, I can't understand the two things. He could mark his face like that by beating his own head in the floor. I saw a young woman do it once at Eversfield uh, Asylum before anyone could lay a hands on her. I suppose he might have broken his neck by falling out of bed if he were in an awkward kink, but for the life of me I couldn't imagine how the two things occurred. If his back was broke, he couldn't beat his head, and if his face was like that before the fall out of bed, there would be marks of it. I said to him, Go to Dr. Van Helsing and ask him to kindly come here at once. I want him without a moment in an instant's delay. The man ran off, and within a few minutes the professor in his dressing gown and slippers appeared. When he saw Renfield on the ground, he looked keenly at him for a moment and then turned to me. I think he recognized my thought in, in my eyes, for he said quietly, manifestingly, the ears for the attendant. Ah, sad accidents. You will need careful watching and att much attendance. I shall stay with you myself, but I shall first dress myself. If you will remain, I shall return in a few minutes to join you. The patient was now breathing strenuously, and it was easy to see that he had suffered some terrible injury. Van Helsing returned with extraordinary celery, bearing with him a surgical case. He had evidently been thinking and had his mind made up, for almost before he looked upon the patient, he whispered to me, Send the attendant away. We must be alone with him if and when he becomes conscious after the operation. So I said, I think that will do for now, Simmons. We have done all that we can at present. You had best go make your rounds, and Dr. Van Helsing will operate. Let me know the instant if there is anything unusual anywhere else. The man withdrew, and we went into the strict examination of the patient. The wounds of the face were superficial. The real injury was a depressed fracture of the skull, extended right up to the monitor area. The professor thought for a moment and said, We must reduce the pressure and get him back to normal conditions as far as he can be. The rapidity of the suffusions show the terrible nature of his injury. The whole motor area seems affected. The suffusion to the brain will increase quickly, so he must turn fine at once, or it will be too late. As he was speaking, there was a soft tapping at the door. I went over and opened it and found in the corridor without Arthur and Quincy in pajamas and slippers. The former spoke. I heard your man call up Dr. Helsing and tell him of an accident, so I woke Quincy, or rather called for him as he was not sleeping. Things are moving too quickly and too strangely for any sound of sleep for any of these times. I've been thinking that tomorrow might we might not see things as they have been. We'll have to look back and forward a little more than we have done. May we come in? I nodded and held the door open until they entered, then closed again. When Quincy saw the attitude and state of the patient and noted the horrible pool of blood, he said softly, My God! What's happened to him? Poor, poor devil? I told him briefly and added that we expected that he would recover consciousness after the operation for a short time at all events. He, was at one, he went at once and sat down at the edge of the bed with Glaudamine beside him. We all watched in patience. We shan't wait, we shall wait, said Van Helsing, just long enough to fix the best spot for trephining, so that we may most quickly and perfectly remove the blood clot, 
for it is evident that the hemorrhage is increasing. The minutes during which we waited passed with fearful slowness. I had a horrible sinking in my heart, and from Van Helsing's face I gathered he felt some fear or apprehension as to what was to come. I dreaded the words that Renfield might speak. I was positively afraid to think. The conviction of what was to, what was coming on was coming on to me, as I had read of men who had heard the death watch. The poor man's breathing came in unexpected gasps. Each instant he seemed as though he would open his eyes and speak, but then would follow a prolonged strenuous breath, and he would relapse into a more fixed instability. Ensured that I was at the, most of the sick bed in death, this the suspense grew and grew upon me. I could almost hear the beating of my own heart. The blood surging through my temples sounded like a blows from a hammer. The silence finally became agonizing. I looked to my companions, one after the other, and saw from their flustered faces and damp brows that they were enduring the equal torture. This was a nervous suspense for all of us, as though overhead some dread bell would pell out, powerf out powerfully when we least expected. At last, there came a time when it was evident that the patient was sinking faster. He might die at any moment. I looked up at the professor and caught his eyes fixed on mine. His face was stern as he spoke. It's no time to lose. His words may be worth many lives. I have been thinking so as I stood here. It may be it is a soul at stake. We shall operate just above the ear. Without another word, he made the operation. For a few moments, the breathing continued to be strenuous, and then came a breathing so prolonged that it seemed as it would tear open his chest. Suddenly, his eyes opened and fixed in a wild, helpless stare. This continued for a few moments. Then it softened into glad surprise, and from the lips came a sigh of relief. He moved convulsively, and as he did so said, I'll be quiet, doctor. Tell them to take off the straight waistcoat. I've had a terrible dream. It left me so weak that I cannot move. What's wrong with my face? It, it feels so swollen, and it smarts dreadfully. He tried to turn his head, but even with, with the efforts, his eyes seemed to grow glassy again, so I gently put it back. Then Van Helsing said in a quiet, grave tone, Tell us your dream, Mr. Renfield. As he heard the voice, his face brightened, though its mutations, and he said, That is Dr. Van Helsing. How good it is of you to be here. Give me some water. My lips are dry, and I shall tell you. I dreamed. He stopped and seemed fainting. I called quickly to, the, to Quincy. The brandy! Quick, it is in my study! He flew and returned with a glass, the decanter of brandy, and a, a kaffir of water. We moistened the parched lips, and the patient quickly revived. It seemed, however, that his poor injury, injured brain had been working in the interval, for when he was quite conscious, he looked at me piercingly with an agonized confusion, which I shall never forget, and said, I must not deceive myself. It was no dream, but a, a grim reality. Then his eyes roved around the room. As I caught sight of the two figures sitting patiently at the edge of the bed, he went on. If I were not so already, I would know from them. For an instant his eyes grew closed, not with pain or sleep, but voluntary, as if though he was bringing all of his faculties to bear. When he opened them, he said hurriedly, and with more energy than he had already displayed. Quick, doctor, quick! I'm dying! I feel that I have but a few minutes, and then I must go back to death, <coughs> or worse. Wet my lips with brandy again. I have something that I must say before I die, or before my poor crushed brain dies anyhow. <laughs> Thank you. It was that night that you left me, when I implored you to let me go away. I couldn't speak then, for I felt my tongue was tied. But I was as sane then, except in that way as I am now. I was in agony of despair for a long time after you left me. It seemed hours. Then there came a sudden peace to me. 
My brain seemed to become cool again, and I realized where I, I was. I heard the dogs bark behind our house, but not where he was. As she spoke, Van Helsing's eyes never blinked, but his hand came out and met mine and gripped it hard. He did not, however, betray himself. He nodded slightly and said, Go on, in a low voice. Renfield proceeded. He came up to me in the window in the, in the mist, as I had seen him often before, but he was solid then, not a ghost. But his eyes were fierce like a man's when angry. He was laughing with a red mouth. His teeth sparkly and sharp white glinted in the moonlight when he turned to look back over the bent trees where the dogs were barking. He wouldn't ask me to c I wouldn't ask him to come in at first, though I knew he wanted to, just as he had always wanted all along. Then he began promising me things, not in words, but by doing them. He was interrupted by a word from the professor. How? By making them happen. Just as he used to send in the flies during this when the sun was shining, great big fat ones with steel and sapphire wings and big moths in the night with skull and crossbones on their back. Van Helsing nodded to him as he whispered to me unconsciously, The Aconasius Atrephus of the Sinfres. That's you, it's called the Deaf Head Smuff. The patient went on without stopping. Then he began to whisper, Rats, 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 hundreds, thousands, millions of them, and every one alive. And dogs eat them, and cats too. All lives, all red, with years of blood in them. And not merely buzzing flies. I laughed at him, but wanted to see what he could do. Then the dogs howled away beyond the dark trees in his house. He beckoned me to the window. I got up and I looked out. He raised his hands and seemed to call out without saying any words. A dark mass spread over the grass, coming on like the shape of a flame of fire. And then he moved the mist to the right and out. And he raised his hands and left. And I could see there were thousands of rats with their eyes blazing red like his, only smaller. He held his hand up, and they all stopped. I thought he might be, and then he, I thought he might be seen to be saying, all of these lives I will give you. I, and many more and greater, grow countless sages if you will fall down and worship me. And then a, a, a red cloud at the color of blood seemed to close over my eyes, and before I knew what I was doing, I found myself opening the sash and saying to him, Come in, Lord and Master. The rats were all gone, but he slid into my room through the sash, though it was only but open an inch wide, just as the moon herself had often come in through the tiniest crack, and he stood before me in all of her size and splendor. His voice grew weaker. So I moistened his lips with brandy again, and he continued, but it seemed as though his memory had gone on working in an interval until his story was further advanced. I was about to call to him to back to the point, but Van Helsing whispered to me, Let him go on. Do not interrupt him. He can't go back now. And maybe he could not proceed all at once if he had lost this thread of thought. He proceeded. All day I waited to hear from him, but he did not send me anything, not even a blowfly. And when I went, and when the moon got up, I was pretty angry with him. When he slid in through the window, at, at, though at once it was shut, and didn't even knock, I was mad with him. He sneered at me, and his white face looked out at the, of the mist with his red eyes gleaming, and he went on as though he owned the whole place. I was no one. He didn't even smell the same as he went by. I couldn't hold him, I thought. Somehow, Mrs. Harker had come into the room. The two men on the bed stood up and came over, standing beside him so that he could not see him. But when they could obey him better, they were both silent, but the professor started and quivered. His face, however, grew grimmer and sterner still. Renfield went on without noticing. 
When Mrs. Harker came in to see me this afternoon, she wasn't the same. It was like tea after the teapot had been watered. Here we all moved, but no one said a word, he went on. I didn't know she was still here until she spoke. She didn't look the same. I don't care for pale people. I like them with lots of blood in them, and hers her seemed to all but run out. I didn't think of it at the time, but when she went away, I began to think, and it made me mad to know that he had taken the life out of her. I could feel the rest quivered, as I did, but we remained otherwise still. So he came tonight. I was ready for him. I saw the mist stealing in, and I grabbed it tight. I had heard that madmen have unnatural strength, and as I knew I was a madman, at times anyhow, I resolved to use my power. Hey, and he felt it too, for he had come from the uh, out of the mist to struggle with me. I held tight, and I thought I was going to win, for I didn't mean him to take any more of her life till I saw his eyes. They burned into me, and my strength became like water. He slipped through it, and when I tried to cling to him, he raised me up and flung me down. There was a red cloud before me, and a noise like thunder, and the mist seemed to steal away under the door. His voice became fainter and his breath more strenuous. Van Helsing stood up instinctively. We now know the worse, he said. He is here, and we know his purpose. This might not be too late. Let us be armed, the same as we were the other night, but lose no time. There is not an instant to spare. There was no need to put our fear, nay, our conviction into words. We shared them in common. We hurried and took to from our rooms the same things we had when we entered the Count's house. The professor had his ready, and as we met in the corridor, he pointed at them significantly and said, They will never leave me. They shall not till this unhappy business is over. Be wise also, my friends. It is not com it is no common enemy that we deal with. Alas, alas, that is our dear Madame Mina should suffer. He stopped his voice breaking, and I do not know if rage or terror predominated my own heart. Outside the Harker's door we paused. Art and Quincy held back and ladder. Shall we shall we disturb her? We must, said Van Hansen grimly. If the door be locked, I shall break it in. May not frighten her terribly. It's unusual to break into a lady's room. Van Helsing said somberly. You are right as always, but this is life and death. All the chambers are alike into the doctor. And even where they were not, they were still all the one for me tonight. Friend John, when I turn the handle, if the door does not open, do you put your shoulder down and shove. And you too, my friends. Now! He turned the handle as he spoke, but the door did not yield. We threw ourselves against it with a crash it burst open, and we all fell headlong into the room. The doctor actually fell, and I saw across from him as he gathered himself up on his head's knees. What I saw appalled me. I felt my hair rise like bristles on the back of my neck, and my heart seemed to stand still. The moonlight was so bright that through the thick yellow blinds the room was light enough to see. On the bed beside the window lay Jonathan Harker, his face flush, breathing heavily as though in a stupor. Kneeling at the edge of the, of the bed, facing outward, was the white-clad figure of his wife. By her stood a tall, thin man, clad in black. His face was turned from us, but the instant we saw, we all recognized the Count, in every way, even the scar on his forehead. With his left hand, he held both Mina's, uh, Mrs. Harker's hands, keeping them away with his hands at full, hands full attention. His right hand gripped her by the back of the neck, forcing her down for, on her bosom. Her white nightdress was smeared with blood, and a thick, thin stream trickled down the man's bare breast, which was shown to have been torn open dress. The attitude of the two had a terrible re resemblance of a child forcing a kitten's nose into a saucer of milk to compel to drink it. As we burst into the room, the Count turned his face, and the hellish look that I had heard described seemed to leap into it. 
His eyes flamed red with devilish passion. The great nostrils of the white aquiline nose opened wide and quivered at the edge, and the white sharp teeth behind the full lips of blood-dripped mouth clapped together like those of a wild beast. With a wretch, which he threw his victim back onto the bed, as though hurling from a height, he turned and sprang at us. By, the time, by this time, the professor had gotten gained to his feet and was holding towards him an envelope which contained the sacred wafer. The count suddenly stopped from the height, just as poor Lucy had done outside the tomb, and cowered back. Further and further back he cowered as we, lifting our crucifixes, advanced. The moonlight suddenly failed as a great crowd of black sailed across the sky. And when the gaslight sprang up upon Quincy's match, we saw nothing but vapor. This, as we looked, trailed under the door, which, with the recoil from its bursting, sailed across the sky, and when the and opened, had swung back in its old position. Van Helsing, Arthur, and I moved forward to Mrs. Harker, who by this time had drawn her breath and had given it a scream so wild, so ear-piercing, so disparaging that it seemed to me now that it would ring in my ears till my dying day. For a few seconds she lay helpless. She lay in her helpless attitude of disarray. Her face was ghastly, with a pallor that seemed to articulate by blood, which was smeared her lips, and cheeks, and chin. From her throat trickled a thin stream of blood. Her eyes seemed mad with terror. Then she put her before her face, her poor crushed hands, which bore on their whiteness the red marks of the Count's terrible grip. And from behind them came a low, desolate wail that made the terrible scream only quick, only the quick explosion of endless grief. Van Helsing stepped forward and drew the, cr the cravat gently over her body, whilst Art, after looking at her face for an in instant despairingly, ran out of the room. Van Helsing whispered to me, Jonathan is in a stupor, such as Vince we know the vampire can produce. We could do nothing for poor Madame Mina for the few moments until she recovers herself. I must fake him. He dipped the end of a, of a towel in cold water and began to flick him in the face, his wife all the while holding her face between her hands and sobbing in a way that was heartbreaking to hear. I raised the blind and looked out the window. There was, only mu there was much moonshine, and as I looked, I could see Quincy Morris run across the lawn and hide himself in the shadow of a great yew tree. It puzzled me to think why he was doing this, but in an instant I heard Harker's quick exclamation as he woke from partial consciousness and turned over to the bed. On his face there might as well be with a look of wild amazement. He seemed dazed for a few seconds, and then full consciousness seemed to burst upon him all at once, and he stood up. His wife was aroused by the quick movement and turned to him with her arms stretched out as though to embrace him. Instantly, however, she drew them again and pulled her elbows together, holding her hands before her face and shut it into the bed to, um, beneath her shock. In God's name, what does this mean? Harker cried out. D Dr. Seward, Dr. Van Helsing, what is it? What has happened? What is wrong? Mina, dear, what is it? What does this blood mean? Oh my God, my God, has it come to this? And raising himself to his knees, he beat his hands wildly together. Good God, help us! Help her, oh, help her! With a quick movement, he jumped from bed and began to put on his clothes. All the men in his, uh, in him, had, and all the man in him had awakened in the need of instant exhortation. What has happened? Tell me about it, he cried without pausing. Dr. Van Helsing, you love Mina, I know. Oh, do something to save her. He cannot be gone too far. Guard her while I go look for him. His wife, through her terror and horror distress, saw some sure danger to him, instantly forgetting her own grief, and seizing hold of him, cried out, No! No, Jonathan, you mustn't leave me. I've suffered enough tonight. God knows without the dread of him harming you. You must stay with me. Stay with these friends who will watch over you. Her expression became frantic as she spoke, and he, yielding to her, she pulled him down, sitting on the bed, and clung to him fiercely. Van Helsing and I tried to calm them. The professor held up a little gold crucifix and said in wonderful calmness, Do not fear, my dear. We are here, and far as this is close to you, no foul things can approach. You are safe tonight, and we must be calm and counsel together. 
she shuddered and went silent, holding down her head on her husband's breast. When she raised it, her white nightgown that was stained with blood where her lips had touched, and with a thin open wound on her neck had sent forth drops, the instant she shod that she drew back with a low wail and whispered amidst the choking sobs, Unclean! Unclean! I must touch him or kiss him no more! Oh, that it should be it is I who was his worst enemy, and whom he may not have caused to have great fear. To this he spoke out resolutely. Nonsense, Mita. It is a shame to me to hear such words. I will not hear it from you, and I shall not hear it from you. May God judge me by my deserts, and punish me more bitterly in suffering at this hour, if by any act or will of mine anything has ever come between us. He put his hands and folded to his breast, and for a while she lay there sobbing. He looked to, over to us, bowed his head, with eyes that blinked damply over his quivering nostrils. His mouth was set of steel. After he, a while, her sobs became less frequent and more faint. And then he said to me, speaking with a studied calmness, which I felt tried his nervous power to its utmost. And now, Dr. Seward, tell me about it. Too well I know the broad fact. Tell me all about that has been. I told him exactly what happened, and he listened with seeming impassiveness. But his nostrils twitched and his eyes blazed as I told him through ruthless hands of the Count that held his wife in that terrible and horrid position, with his mouth, with her mouth, to the open wound of his breast. It interests me, even at that moment, to see that whilst the face of white seemed set passion worked convulsively over the brow, the hands tenderly and lovingly stroked the ruffled hair. Just as I finished, Quincy and Goldamine knocked on the door. They entered in obedience to our summons. Van Helsing looked at me questioningly. I understand him to mean that if they were to take advantage of the coming of the d their coming to divert quite possibly the thoughts of the unhappy husband and wife from each and from themselves. So, on nodding acquiescence to him, he asked what they had seen or done, to which Lord Glaudamine answered, I could not see him anywhere in the passage or in any of our rooms. I went into the study, but though he had been there, he was gone. He had, however... He stopped suddenly, looking at the poor, drooping figure on the bed. Van Helsing said gravely, Go on, Zinfrenatza. We want here no more concealments. Our hope is now is all that is knowing. Tell freely. So Art went on. He had been there, though it could not only have been for a few seconds. He made rare haze of the place. All the manuscripts that had been burned and the blue flames flickered amongst the white ashes. The cinders, the cylinders of your Polograph were too thrown into the flame, and the wax had helped the flames. Here I interrupted. Thank God there's another, the other copy is in the safe. His face lit up for a moment, but then fell again as it went on. I ran downstairs, but he see no sight of him. I looked into Renfield's room, but there was no trace, except... Again, he paused. Go on, Harker said hoarsely. So he bowed his head and moistened his lips with his tongue and added... Except that the poor fellow was dead. Mrs. Harker raised her head, looking from one side to another, and she said solemnly, God's will be done. I could not but feel that Art had been keeping back something, but as I took, uh, took, it, as, uh, took it as with some purpose, I said nothing. Van Helsing turned to Morris and asked, As you, dear Fincrency, have you any to tell? A little, he answered. It may not. It may be much eventually, but at present I can't say. I thought it well to know that, if possible, where the count would go on from when he left the house. I didn't see him, but I saw a bat rise from Renfield's window and flap westward. I expected to see him in some shape go back to Carfax, but he had evidently sought some other lair. He will not go. He will not go back tonight, for the sky is reddening in the east and the dawn is close. We must work tomorrow. He said the latter words in his st through his shut teeth. For a, s a space, perhaps, of a couple of minutes, there was silence, and I could fancy that I could hear the sounds of our heart beating. Then Van Helsing said, placing his hand tenderly on Mrs. Harker's head, And now, Mazamina, <sighs> poor dear Mazamina, tell us exactly what happens. God knows I do not want to know you to be pains, but it is needed that we all know. 
from now more than ever has all our work need to be done quick and sharp and in deadly earnest. The day is close to us that it must all end. If it might be so, and now is the chance that we might live and learn. The poor dear lady shivered. and I could see the tension in her nerves. She clasped her husband closer to her and bent her head lower and still to her breast. And then she raised her head proudly and held it in one hand to Van Helsing, who took it in his, and after he stopped stooping and kissing it reverently, held it fast. The other hand was locked into that of her husband, who held her other arm thrown around her protectively. After a pause in which she evidently was ordering her thoughts, she began, I took a sleeping draught for which you had so kindly given me, but for a long time I did not act. I seemed to become more wakeful and myriads of horrible fancies began to crowd into my mind, all of it them connected with death and vampires, with blood and pain and terrible trouble. Her husband involuntarily groaned as she turned to him and said lovingly, Do not fret, dear, you must be brave and strong and help me through this horrible task. If only, if you only knew what an effort it is to, for me to tell of this fearful thing at all, you must understand how I, much I need your help. Well, I saw I must try and help the medicine to its work with my will, if it was to do any good, so I resolutely set myself to sleep. Surely enough sleep must have overcome me, for I remember no more. Jonathan coming in had not wakened me, for he lay by my side when next I remember. There in the room, the same thin white mist that I had once before noticed, but I forgot now, if you know this, you must find in my diary, for which I will show you later. I felt the vague terror that overcame me in the same sense of presence. I turned to wake Jonathan, but found he slept so soundly that it seemed as if he would be, who had been taken with the same sleeping drought, and not I. I tried, but I could not wake him. This caused me a great fear, and I looked around terrified. Then my heart sank as it seems as if it within me, beside the bed as if he had stopped out of, stepped out of the mist, or rather if the mist had turned into his figure, for it had entirely disappeared. Stood a tall, thin man, all in black. I knew him at once from the description of the others, the waxen face, the aquiline nose, for which the light filled fell into a thin white line, the parted red lips with the sharp white teeth sh showing between, and the red eyes that seemed to have that in the sunset of on the one of the windows of St. Mary's Church in Whitby, I knew too the red scar on his forehead from which Jonathan had struck him. For an instant my heart stood still, and I would seem to have screamed out. If only I was paralyzed. In the pause he spoke in a soft, keen, cutting whisper, pointed at Jonathan and, as he spoke. Silence. If you make a sound, I shall take him and dash his brains out before your very eyes. I was appalled and too bewildered to do anything or say anything. With a mocking smile, he placed one hand on my shoulder and holding me tight, bared my throat with the other, saying it as he did so, first, a little refreshment to reward my exhortations. You may very well be, you may very well be quiet. This is not the first time or the second time that your veins have appeased my thirst. I was bewildered, but strangely enough, I did not want to hinder him. I suppose it was part of that horrible curse that such as when he touches made on his victim. Oh, my God, my God, pity me. He placed his reeking lips upon my throat. Her husband groaned again. She clasped his hat harder and looked at it to him pityingly, as if he were the injured one, and went on. I felt my strength fading away, and I was half in a swoon. How long this terrible thing lasted, I know not. But it seemed a long time must have passed before his foul, awful, sneering mouth away. I saw it drip with fresh blood. The remembrance seemed to have for a while overpowered her, and she drooped and would have sunk down but her husband's strange, sustaining arm. With great effort, she recovered herself and went on. Then he spoke to me mockingly. And so you, like the others, would you play your brains against mine? 
You would keep these. You would help these men to hunt me and frustrate me in my designs. You know now, and they now know in part already, and will know in full before long what it is to cross my path. They should have known kept their energies for use closer to home, whilst they play their wits against me, against me who has commanded the nations, had intrigued for them, had fought for them hundreds of years before they were even born. I was countermanding them, and you, their best beloved one, are now to me flesh of my flesh, blood of my blood, king of my king my bountiful rhyme press for a while and shall later become my companion and my helper you shall avenge in turn for not one of them but shall minister to your needs but as of yet you are to be punished for what you have done you have aided in thwarting me now you shall come to my call when my brain says come to you you shall cross the land and see to do my bidding and to that end this with that he pulled open his shirt and with a, his long sharp nails opened a vein in his breast when the blood began to spurt out he took my hands in one of his holding them tight and with the other seized my neck and pressed my mouth to the wound so that I must either suffocate or swallow some of the Oh, my God, my God, what have I done? What have I done to deserve such a fate? I who tried to walk in meekness and righteousness in all my days, God pity me. Look down on a poor soul in worse than mortal peril, and in mercy pity those who she holds dear. And then she began to rub her lips as though to cleanse them from the pollution. As she was telling her terrible story, the eastern sky began to quicken and everything became more and more clearer. Harker was still quiet, but over his face, as the awful narrative went on, came a great look which deepened and deepened in the morning light, till when the first red streak of the coming dawn shut up, the flesh stood up, darkly, against the whitening hair. We had arranged that one of us is to stay within call of the unhappy pair until we meet together and arrange to take action. Of this I am sure. The sun rises today on no more miserable house than all the great round of its daily course.